Hey everyone, welcome back to Zero Proof Home Bar once again. Today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about why many of the non-alcoholic spirit products cost what they do. They're kind of expensive. A lot of times they're around the same level as like a, a mid-level gin or whiskey, a traditional spirit. And uh, there are a lot of questions as to whether it needs to be uh, that way, whether they have to cost what they do, is it a cost of production, etc. I don't know for sure, but I have some thoughts. I've done some research. So uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that today. But again, just before I start, I wanted to preface, I'm not an expert at this. I've never done alcoholic or non-alcoholic spirits production or distillation or anything like that. So um, I am going on some information and some uh, kind of thinking around this that I've done. And I hope it's helpful, but uh, you know, uh, take my thoughts with a grain of salt here. So the first thing to think about is pretty obvious. It's the ingredients that go into all of this. Are the ingredients expensive? I think in some cases they are maybe a little bit harder to find. There's some unusual ingredients and whatnot. I think that some of the non-alcoholic products are trying to source more unusual ingredients to kind of maybe make up for not having that kind of a spirit familiarity, not having like, oh, it's gin, so it's juniper, etc. Uh, a lot of them seem to be going in a different direction. I think partly because it's hard to get some of those flavors uh, effectively into non-alcoholic products. So like juniper, for example, doesn't seem to translate well into a non-alcoholic context, at least from what I've found so far. Um, but I also think they're using more unusual products like the Pentier Adrift, for example, has rock samphire in it. Uh, I've never seen that in any other spirit product. Why are they using that? Well, I think it's partly to set themselves apart because it is true that no other products are using it. So it stands out if somebody's reading the label, etc. It's like, oh, that's unusual. That's interesting. I, that ties into a point that I have a little bit later, but I think sourcing some of these ingredients might be a, a little bit more intense, a little bit more costly or, or challenging. Uh, so that might be one factor. Uh, but of course, there are a lot of alcoholic products that also source some very unusual ingredients, a lot of handmade stuff, a lot of hand forage, etc. So that, uh, certainly that's not going to be a primary reason for the cost in my view. The other thing I'll mention about ingredients is a lot of these products are going to be based on water, essentially. They have some other ingredients, glycerin a lot of times, and certain acids and stuff as preservatives. But the base is usually water because it's non-alcoholic. Spirits you know, alcohol is a pretty cheap uh, baseline product, like neutral grain spirit is a pretty inexpensive product, but it's not as cheap as water, uh, especially water out of the tap. And there are also taxes that a lot of countries and the U.S. states impose on alcoholic products in particular. And, you know, in some cases they can be fairly high, uh, relatively speaking. Even if they're not necessarily high, it's an additional cost on top of that. So that is an ingredient factor that uh, weighs more on the cost of traditional spirits. So I don't think the ingredients are probably the primary uh, thing that's going on here. So there are also their production methods, another obvious uh, factor here. I think that there are some kind of pros and cons here as well. A lot of these products can use a traditional kind of distillation that doesn't use alcohol that you might use for um, essential oil extraction and stuff like that. And that can take a lot of raw material to get a lot of flavor coming out of it. So uh, that might be one reason is just having to use a lot of your raw materials. You have to do the same thing in traditional spirits production too, though. A lot of uh, distilleries will tell you it takes like, I don't know, 10 or 20 apples or something like that to make an, a bottle of Applejack. Uh, so it, it is a fairly, I mean, it's by nature a uh, concentrating process. Distillation is a process of taking a larger amount of ferment raw material and distilling it down into a smaller amount of concentrated alcoholic uh, product. So again, I think, you know, it's kind of a wash uh, when it comes to uh, that kind of a thing. But I will say that there are some products in the market that are actually removing alcohol from a distilled uh, product or some other kind of product that already had alcohol in it, then they had to remove it. And they're trying to do that in order to get a more authentic flavor out of it. So I think Martini and Rossi is doing this with some of their uh, newer non-alcoholic vermouth products, for example. And that is going to be more expensive because you start with an alcoholic product. You start with essentially the vermouth you would already be selling off the shelf, and then you have to do an expensive process of removing the alcohol from it. So that's an actually good reason why uh, it might be a little bit more expensive for those products in particular. But not all these products do that. Not all of them start with something alcoholic and remove the alcohol. In fact, a lot of them do not do that. And this brings me to sort of the last major reason that I think is probably responsible for a lot of the pricing in this category, unfortunately. Um, before I get there, I'll just say briefly, I'm sure there are factors that I'm not aware of, and I do think that production methods are probably one of them. Some of the fact that 
the equipment for doing this and the methods for doing this are not necessarily as well documented and as widely you know, shared and understood and everything as uh, working with spirits. There is a lot of potential inspiration and tooling and methods that can be drawn from traditional uh, essential oil extraction and stuff like that, like I talked about. But there still is a lot of proprietary stuff that each of these companies is figuring out to kind of make the product that they make uh, come out the way it does. So that is kind of a, a little bit of a wild card that I can't account for that, that may well account for a decent amount of the cost of production. But I do think a big aspect of the pricing is actually just marketing. Uh, and I am not the hugest fan of this as a way of setting uh, the price from a sort of moralistic uh, standpoint, but from a practical standpoint, it makes perfect sense. These products are all trying to position themselves against the alcoholic alternative. And they want to come across essentially as premium products. They want the customer, the person who buys, to feel like they've bought something that is kind of special, um, that is uh, artisanal, that is, you know, produced in small batches and all that kind of stuff. And like it or not, pricing is one of the ways that that is communicated to consumers. What is it that, that really distinguishes these things from other flavored things that were already in the market uh, years before? You had your flavored sparkling and still waters uh, that used, you know, flavor extracts and other kinds of things. These are not all that different. A lot of them are using uh, different kinds of flavors, a little bit more um, modern botanical flavors and stuff like that. So they're a little more distinctive, uh, but they're not necessarily using dramatically different uh, methods or having ultimately a dramatically different product. So how do you differentiate that? How do you not end up having to sell your product at, you know, the price of LaCroix or something like that? Uh, because that's a flavored water, right? And you can buy cans of that for 70 cents or, or something like that. So positioning it, you know, the packaging is a big part of that, right? They package them to look like normal uh, alcoholic spirit products. Um, the bottling, the, the packaging, the labeling, all that kind of stuff. And the pricing goes along with that. They're priced to essentially compare one-to-one -one with spirit products that are on the shelves as well and kind of fit into that same category in people's minds. So uh, again, I'm not the biggest fan of, of that driving pricing, but I also totally understand it. Uh, and I like that there are all of these products on the market. They didn't exist before. The market was much more value-based and now it's more kind of, you know, premium oriented. But I think some of these products, not all of them, but some of them genuinely uh, are standing out and doing unique and interesting things. And at the end of the day, if you think about the spirits market, uh, there are gins that cost $10 for 750 milliliters. And there are gins that cost $1,000 for that. And that's, you know, extreme ends of the scale. But there are everyday gins someone could buy in BevMo that might cost eighty dollars for seven hundred fifty milliliter, and th so it's a premium gin, right? What really separates that from the low end, you know, bottom shelf gin, so to speak, or vodka or whatever? Production methods is part of it. Uh, branding is a huge part of it, and ultimately, what matters most is how does the product taste? What is the experience of the product itself? Uh, and that does include the, the the bottling and the branding and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, what's in the bottle hopefully matters the most. And uh, so is it worth the price for the experience you're getting if it's an experience that's comparable to a traditional spirit? And I think the answer can be yes. It, ultimately, if a spirit is worth $30 for a bottle and it gives you a certain experience and you get a certain number of servings out of that, if you potentially can get a similar experience and similar number of servings from a non-alcoholic spirit of your choice, then, you know, I think the value equation is kind of similar there. There's sort of this arbitrary, well, you know, alcohol is worth this amount. It's really about experience, ultimately. So all of these elements, um, the ingredients that go into it, the production methods, et cetera, and the branding all come in to add up to your experience in the end. Uh, and that's what matters. So if your experience is worthwhile, is high quality, is enjoyable, then the product, it can potentially be worth it. I don't think they should charge a really extreme premium, but I think $30, uh, you know, it's acceptable. Uh, I'd like to live in a world where things could cost more what they uh, cost to make, and you wouldn't have to price something higher in order to bring across a certain impression to the end uh, consumer. But that actually is the world in which we live, and it is human psychology, ultimately, uh, that it comes down to. So. Uh, that's part of the reason why I want to taste through all of these, because I think some of them are genuinely worth what they cost. 
for the experience that you get uh, and how that compares to a, a regular spirits and cocktail experience. So I think that's ultimately the, the answer. Regardless of what it costs to produce the thing, you could ask the same questions of traditional spirits and uh, what really matters is what does the market support and what is the experience worth to you? So hopefully I help you find some products that are worth the cost to you. And uh, I'm also really hoping to share some lower cost uh, recipes that don't necessarily rely on these kinds of spirits, but things maybe you can make at home uh, or ingredients that you can buy off the shelf that are uh, less expensive and can still make you a really great cocktail experience. So look forward to those in the future. I'll be sharing some more recipes. And uh, in the meantime, thanks for joining me. hope this was helpful and interesting. If you have any questions, if you have any suggestions, any points that I missed in considering why these products cost what they do, uh, please let me know. You can do that down in the comments or you can email me, whatever you like. Love to hear from you. And uh, like and subscribe. Look forward to some more recipes and I will see you next time. Thanks for joining me.